Hi, I'm David Baird, violin maker and researcher. And welcome to this Cremona Revival video about different ways to make violins. We'll consider several approaches. Mostly we'll focus on old Cremona methods and how these differ from modernized and copy-based making. Hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. Cremona Revival. Can we do as they did? From their traditions and tools, each build unique? Can we read and use the geometry behind those great Italian instruments? Yes. Here we have Strad's original violin, nicknamed the Messiah, side by side with one of Guillaume's several copies of this instrument. And uh, in our exploration of old Cremona making and how it differs from modern making and copy making, it might be reasonable to first ask, are these really so different? Uh, how do these two approaches diverge? And we'll come at this looking at process quite a bit. In general, a reasonable first question is how do we get the shapes of a violin? How did we originally get the shapes? And how do we get the shapes now? For the copyist approach, it's a fairly straightforward thing. We copy the shapes from examples. That's the main method. Um, depending on the copy environment, that might be a very loose thing where we copy the style of a maker from memory, certain ideas or flavors of the shape. Or it might be a very precise thing where we're really exactly copying an instrument. Here we have um, the Del Jesu nicknamed the Chrysler. Um, and if we wanted to make a copy of this instrument, we could make an actual trace of the outline, maybe from a poster or a picture. But then we come up to one of the first sort of points of divergence or difficulties. The copyist has a little dilemma here. Um, we could make a template or a half template and we could flip it side to side so the two sides end up exactly equal and symmetric. But when we look closely at our example instrument, we find that the corners and the details, they're not really truly symmetric. Some of it's wear, the instrument's hundreds of years old and some of the edge has been worn. And we could maybe look at the purfling line and correct that. But even when we do that, there's a level of asymmetry that's characteristic in the old classical making. They simply don't come out um, sort of machine precise. It's a more organic looking thing. And so we have this dilemma. Do we perfect our outline? Do we make it perfect and symmetric? Or do we uh, try and incorporate those asymmetries that we're seeing. Now if we look at nature, one of our ideals of beauty, the products of nature are never actually symmetric. They're obviously symmetric in design, there's a DNA code behind it all, and each little petal in a flower is going to be grown with that same basic DNA recipe but they just don't turn out exactly equal. And so this is, um, this is a complex question. If we're a copyist, do we fix and perfect our templates? So right at the beginning, this is where the roads diverge. Uh, it's in how the shapes are created in the old Cremona methods versus copying. Uh, and just an aside here, a lot of these screens are very wordy, and the pacing of the video won't necessarily give time to read them. Sometimes they are giving uh, extra supporting detail, but the main points will certainly be covered in the narrative. All right, so the roads diverge. The copyist is making a template and has to deal with these asymmetries that are natural to the Cremona process. Do we fix them? Do we ignore them? So let's look at processes a little bit and how that comes up. The traditional Cremona making gets its shapes by building them up each one each time with traditional recipes of geometry uh, using the simplest means just compass and straight edge and simple ratios with integers the kind of things like one to two or four to seven simple numbers nothing fancy the copies on the other hand they're copying so they look at a shape in its final outcome and then they copy the whole of that for the Cremona 
Um, the outline is a composite of many circle arcs. And where do you put the center? Where do you make this arc? How big is it? A lot of choices, and they build up to the outline. For the copyist, there's one big choice. Am I copying Strad's Messiah, or Del Jesus Chrysler, or which instrument am I copying? Or am I copying loosely? Am I style, copying the style of Strad? But it's a big choice. It's a whole choice. And then you make a whole outline. Now, that gives a different relationship. And with the Cremona method, there's a lot of emphasis on the relationship of parts, one to the other. And in the copy method, you hope to capture that by copying the whole accurately. But these methods are going to differ in the way an error or a variance arises and affects things. So in the Cremona method, you make choices. Uh, am I going to use this ratio or that ratio? And then you work the geometry. But this, the old makers don't seem to be super concerned with working that geometry with great accuracy. So there's a lot of concern of, am I going to use 3 by 4 as my ratio or 4 by 5 as my ratio this time? But then when that's decided, there's a, a looseness about how accurately they place the compass points and execute that. And that's where the, the asymmetries arise in classical making. For the copyist, you're taking it as a whole, and your errors are deviations from the source. This is a, a deep difference right at the beginning. We can begin to see some of the physical aspects of different approaches by looking at the sides and how they're made. Broadly, there are three basic approaches to building the sides. One is to use an outside mold, one is to use an inside mold, and the other uses no mold at all and builds it on the back. Uh, some of the early making was this way, and a lot of the uh, lower cost cottage industry making was built on the back without a mold. The Cremona making used an inside mold. So the sides were actually bent around the mold. And they, these molds are quite particular. Uh, they're thin. Uh, they have notches where bits of wood can be inserted as blocks to attach the ribs. And they have holes for posts. And along with the mold, we have um, binding blocks that pull the rib onto the mold. And then cord is wrapped between the binding block and the post to pull it tight. And this is how, instead of clamps, this is how they did it. And this is the old system. It doesn't control the sides that well. They can have a little bit of vertical twists come into play. But it got the job done, and this is how it was done classically. Now, there's a consequence to this uh, as far as planning. If a classical maker somehow decided they wanted to determine the outline of an instrument beforehand, they wouldn't have much luck with this system. You could make a plan and you could make a mold to follow that plan, but compared to the outline geometry that they traditionally used, their mold geometry is a little bit simplified. It doesn't capture all the details. And they always worked within their tradition, so their molds have only some of the complexity of the final outlines. Also, it just isn't that physically controlled of a system. So the sides are always going to end up a little bit different than you intended. A little bit twisted, slightly asymmetrical. The classical system just isn't designed to prevent that. Now, copyists can use all sorts of mold methods. They might use an outside mold or an inside mold, but they're generally going to try and exert more control than the classical system did. And that's the distinguishing feature, the distinguishing difference, where they get physically different. Once the sides are completed, and with neck attached and removed from the mold, we can begin work on the final outline. It starts by preparing a board for the back. The sides themselves are very flexible. You can push them a little bit shorter or stretch them a little bit longer, and you can push the width of the bouts in or out a little bit. So what we do is we pin this to the board for the back. We put a pin between the upper block into the backboard, and we put a, a pin from the lower block into the backboard. And this lets us fix the length, and then we can actually sort of twist the sides and neck assembly around these pins and get the neck lined up straight, and we can push and pull the bouts in and out a little bit to get the ratios the way we like them, everything to support a good outline. We clamp things in place where we want them, and then we etch this shape 
into the board for the back. Then we can remove the sides for later and we have a board with the shape of the side etched into it. And it's around this etching that we develop the outline and we use traditional recipes of geometry to do this. They're closely related to the recipes that made the mold for these sides, but they're a little bit richer. They allow us to reconcile with these sides better with that extra complexity. And we followed the corners. The corners are very likely going to be a little bit asymmetrical, and we follow them. This, uh, it's an interesting relationship. You know, these recipes, this Cremona method, it doesn't ensure squareness, it doesn't ensure asymmetry, it doesn't allow you to start with an exact plan and end up there. It's like a baking recipe. You get to know that, that Grandma makes great cookies, she has a great recipe, and you're going to get a good cookie, but you don't get to know where the chocolate chips are going to land. And it's the same way. This Cremona method ensures the relationships that were developed traditionally for a great violin, and it ensures a wonderful result, balanced and beautiful, but it doesn't ensure an exact specific outcome and doesn't ensure square shapes, and it doesn't avoid asymmetries or wood movement. These old Cremona methods are right in line with ancient descriptive building plans. So for example, when Vitruvius, the Roman architect, describes how to make a ballista weapon, he describes relationships of one part to the next. And in a few pages, he gives a recipe that doesn't just give you one size of ballista, but it shows you how to make small ones and giant ones using the same set of relationships across the whole range. And also you can make a variety of uh, projectiles. You can have large stones as your projectile, or you could have spears, for example. This is somewhat uh, how the Cremona instrument recipes work. And they have old roots. They're really actually specializations of larger North Italian bowed stringed and, and lute type instrument making recipes. For example, the Cremona violin family, all of the bodies, the length to width, is one part less than double. So, you know, if you think of the width of a violin as four parts, double would be eight, and there are no violins like that, four to eight, but there are four to seven, one part less. And the same one recipe gives us violins, violas, cellos. It also gives us viols, and it gives us viola di braccios and all sorts of other bowed strings from late North Italian making. Now, if we go back very far, we're stuck just looking at paintings of instruments because none of the physical examples have really survived. But this, again, gives the appearance that the shapes are friendly to simple compass and straight edge geometries, the same kind of geometries that the violins use. And closer to the beginning of, of actual violin making in Cremona, we can see examples in Brescia and Venice where the same geometry principles are being used and we have examples that we can study. A 2015 MIT study observed an amazing thing running across the long history of North Italian instrument making. They looked at bowed strings, particularly, and the sound holes, and how the shapes changed over the many centuries. Their observations begin with painting evidence of some of the bowed strings from 1000 AD and go all the way to the peak of successes in late Cremona. So they're looking across more than 700 years of development. And they found a surprising, even amazing thing, which is that the shapes changed and mutated over the centuries in a steady way uh, that kept improving the power transmission efficiency of the sound holes in a way they wouldn't have understood at the time, certainly not in any scientific engineering sort of way. In fact, the engineering explanation for this is something that uh, is very recent. But nevertheless, the shapes changed in a way that steadily improved this feature. And uh, that happened in the centuries leading up to the beginning of violin making in Cremona and continued through the two centuries of Cremona making to a peak with Del Gesu and Stradivarius at the peak of Cremona success. And they made a further claim. They said that on a mathematical, statistical level, the progress of this feature looked like evolution, looked like the progress of something evolving 
And that's very interesting. Now, obviously, it's not a biological thing. So what we're talking about is cultural evolution. And that's, that's a very potent idea. It's different than what we're used to in the modern era. We're used to a genius or, or a very driven individual, like Edison, for example, inventing a light bulb. Or some crazy kid puts wheels on a board and you've got a skateboard. So we're used to those moments where a bright idea or an innovative push creates something new. But the old world is full of very sophisticated products that grew slowly and as a cultural tradition. So for example, wines and cheeses and curing meat. And even how an artisan would mix paints or gild gold onto something. These are processes that developed over very long stretches of time. And that's cultural evolution. And it's very interesting to look at that and how it relates also to biological evolution. You know, you could look at something like the eyes. Eyes get reused and developed and specialized, but it's a very constant feature. And that idea of reuse is very powerful. And cultural evolution is there too. Our music notation that we use today is very clear, but it grew out of older systems. And none of it just was invented one day by one person. It grew from nooms to points. You had lines and then they became staves. It grew in small steps with many, many people contributing ideas of how to move it forward and then collectively people deciding which parts they would follow and imitate. So what is it that makes something like cultural evolution actually happen or biological evolution as our model to learn from? Part of it's definitely repetition. Many, many, many attempts at something. And part of it's feedback. Part of it is saying, well, this one was slightly different and it was better. And then deciding or somehow ending up with that improvement repeating more often. Or something's different and it's not as good. And the feedback causing that to be repeated less often. Those are the keys. And that seems to be how both the instruments themselves and the recipes that create them and the traditions of the makers that create them all evolved as a cultural evolution. You can't quite separate it all, the instruments, the recipes, the methods and practices and traditions of the makers. They work together. And that's what evolved. There's a lot of reuse. So if you look closely at how a viol was made, or a viol de braccio, or an early bass, or a viol, or a violin family instrument, what we see is reuse and variation. And in a way, an artisan community is perfect for this. Um, an artisan community provides feedback and judgment within themselves, and they provide sort of a ballast to tradition keep it going, work within the tradition. And that's the difference between innovation proceeding in sort of sudden jolts and cultural evolution proceeding in many small tries and then collective judgment repeating some tries more and other tries less. And that's where you get cultural evolution. And that's a powerful thing. One advantage of evolution is that it accumulates learning. The recipes of old Cremona accumulate centuries of broader learning about what works in boat strings. And that comes to bear in the old Cremona making. And also, evolution can find and develop solutions without you having to know why it works. All that's necessary is that the community, collectively as a whole, ends up repeating a new variation more because they see it as better. That judgment is what's required, not a scientific understanding. And in that light, the progress MIT observed in these sound holes is comprehensible. And the great achievement at the end of seven centuries of development in Lake Cremona is very understandable. Fifty years after the peak of old Cremona making, the world had changed too much, and the continuity of the old traditions was broken. All these sweeping changes led to the rise of modernized copy making and the ascendance of dealer businessmen like Villon. But two centuries after modernization swept out the old methods, the very best violins today are still the ones from Old Cremona. When we look at a side-by-side -side of Strad's Messiah violin and one of Yom's copies, the question now isn't, are they different, but why are they so different? Most of the reasons we've already explored is just a very big difference between a process that starts by outwardly copying shapes in the hope of capturing what's important about them versus a centuries old and evolved tradition that builds up the shapes with recipes of geometry that embed key relationships. And also 
as we've seen, the two approaches are somewhat contradictory. For the copy aim to work, it needs to control the result. You want to capture the shape of the model, so you want to obtain that particular shape. But the old methods don't give you control of the outcome. They give you a process that will give a good result, but not a particular pre-chosen controlled result. And a third reason we haven't talked about too much, which is simply that very careful, faithful copying has historically really been quite rare. Most copying has focused on, on some of the outward features, but has rather freely fixed things or changed things or copied only parts and done many things differently. Many, many copies from the past, for example, use their own system of blocking or lining or they'll change any number of things. So we really don't quite know how more careful recent copying will fare. Maybe it will do very well with time. It's hard to know. Some of the features that are consistent in classical instance that are more commonly copied now than they used to be, we can look at just very briefly. For example, in the sides, the linings are done a particular way, the blocks are done a particular way, and the linings in the center bouts are actually led into the blocks. They're mortised in, which makes that area stronger than it would be otherwise. And then in the long arch of the top and the back, there's a difference in classical making. The long arch for the top has an extended flattish area, and the back is different. Many copyists over the years have made the two similar and very much like the back instead of having that flattish zone that the classical tops have. Another example is a little taper to, to the rib height. And this is something that actually developed in the later Cremona making. It wasn't as present or as consistent in earlier generations. By the time you get to Stradivarius and Del Gesu, you see on the molds, you'll see marked two little radiuses little arcs, and they indicate the full height and the reduced height for the neck area. And that's a feature that today many makers are copying, but historically not so many. For the future, the question is how to follow old Cremona's examples. We're still following them as the best it's ever been, but the question has changed because for a while the methods were actually lost and you really had no choice. You could either innovate, which never proven so successful, or you could copy the old masters at the best you could. And so that was a reasonable thing. But research over the last decades has progressed to the point where we now have an additional option. It's again possible to revive their old methods and traditions and attempt to do as they did. So the question now is, how will we proceed in the future? Thank you for watching our video, and we hope you enjoyed it. Cremona Revival is actually aiming at recovering these old methods enough, completely enough, to allow makers today to once again do as they did to create new original instruments. Eventually, we'd like to see a community of makers working entirely within these recovered old ways.